Hi, Ray here. I'm glad you could join me for this first fireside chat of the season. Do you miss concerts in this time of lockdowns and social distancing? I know I do. So I thought I'd take this uh, somewhat nostalgic trip through the music and the musicians that have inspired me and a few I've been lucky enough to have photographed over the years. And uh, one proviso before I begin. I'd have liked to have included more of the music I'll talk about in this video, were it not for the kind of copyright issues people like uh, Rick Beato deal with all the time just in reviewing music. But do check out Rick's excellent channel. The first concert that I can claim <laughs> to have photographed or made some photographs at was a Mahavishnu Orchestra performance at Vancouver's Pacific Coliseum in 1975, I think it was. For those who aren't familiar with guitarist John McLaughlin's jazz fusion experiments, this was the second incarnation with orchestral accompaniment and jazz violinist Jean-Luc Ponty. It was the first stereo concert at the venue, and I'll never forget the sound of the Asian-style gong driven by percussion mallets washing over the audience from the back of the auditorium, announcing the first crescendo from McLaughlin's guitar and Ponty's violin in unison. I carried my first 35mm camera, a Zenit E, and I've mentioned this camera here before. It was given to me by a friend who was uh, divesting himself of his worldly goods after joining the Hare Krishna movement. It's pretty ironic then that uh, I should use it soon after to photograph John McLaughlin, who was then himself an acolyte of another New Age quasi-religion led by Sri Chinmoy. Carlos Santana was another follower. The negatives from that shoot are lost. Maybe along with the batch <laughs> in a shoebox a cat decided to use as a litter box, so just the prints remain. With that weird fish scale finish that the scanner accentuates. I don't know why they use that kind of paper, but it was pretty common in those days. Still, I treasure this image as my first real concert photograph, and I think it captures very well the spirit of McLaughlin's ecstatic music as he tilts his head while delivering one of his famous staccato flourishes on the six-string half of his double rainbow guitar, custom built by the mad genius Rex Bogue. I had two lenses for that camera, 50 and 35 millimeter focal lengths. I think this was made with the 35 right at the foot of the stage. I can't recall the widest aperture, f2 perhaps, but I'm sure I had it wide open. I'm guessing the film was maybe run-of-the-mill Coda Color 2. That's what I generally used in 1975. In that case, we'd be looking at an ISO or ASA of 80 or 100. 100 ASA came out in 1975, and it wasn't until 1977 that Coda Color 400 gave us a major speed boost. So you can see why I ran into the limits of the exposure triangle here. We don't have uh, EXIF data to figure out my settings, so I'm going to guess I used the Zenit's slowest 1 30th of a second, which was also the flash sync speed, though I didn't use flash here, at f2 or 2.8 or whatever it was. Bulb was the only other option, and I wasn't likely to use an open-ended shutter. If you're familiar with McLaughlin's frenetic solos of the time, then this amount of blur would be entirely consistent with a shutter speed of 1 30th at well, with a, the 35 millimeter lens. So yeah, that was my first concert shoot five years before I entertained the thought of <laughs> turning my hobby into a career. And there would be some rough and hungry years in between. My earliest memories come with musical accompaniment. By the time I was 10, I was a member of the official Beatles fan club with access to those <laughs> special floppy vinyl Christmas records. As I've mentioned here before, my dad was an entertainer working at clubs around England. He worked at one club that had a jukebox, so he'd bring home all the 45s that were displaced by the new Top of the Pops hits. So I soon had a collection that was the envy of my mates. The very first record I bought with my allowance was the Rolling Stones 45, Little Red Rooster, with the flip side off the hook. 
It was the group's second UK number one single, recorded, incidentally, at Chess Studios in Chicago, where so many great blues artists like Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters recorded their blues classics. There's a great little film called Cadillac Records that recalls the times, if not with exact historical accuracy. One of my dearest friends can accurately recount those days in Chicago firsthand. She worked writing liner notes for another label and shared a house with Janis Joplin and her band. There's nothing like music to illuminate the past, is there? I distinctly remember that day that I bought the Stones record. I picked it up at a back alley record shop in Wolverhampton, Heath Town, to be precise. I had a friend, uh, Dennis Matthews, whose family lived there. We took the prize back to his place, one of the old red brick terraced houses that made up the neighborhood, and we played the songs on the family's little record player. I can still recall the light coming through the yellowed window where the record player sat. And Dennis's older sister, her name I forget, uh, but she had a nice figure <laughs> and, of course, wore a miniskirt. Even at 11 years old, I knew that Mick Jagger hadn't taken up farming. <laughs> and the allegorical lyric, originally penned by blues great Willie Dixon and recorded by Howlin' Wolf, weren't just some lament <laughs> for an errant chicken. In those days, I'd walk up to the corner store to pick up my Beatles fan club newsletter and a copy of Cycling Magazine, my other passion. And as an aside, proving that tribalism didn't begin with the internet, I recall sitting in the bleachers at the local velodrome and some guy behind me tugging my mop top, saying, how can you be a cyclist with hair like that? Conversely, when I began shooting fashion in Vancouver in the early 80s, some guy wondered how I could possibly pretend to understand fashion trends. You're a jock, aren't you? So I arrived in Canada in the midst of that great British music invasion, much of it, as in the Rolling Stones example, recycled or reinvigorated American rhythm and blues, as it was called. I wasn't impressed with my new home, because at that time, trends didn't circle the globe by internet in minutes, and Canada was months behind the times. Of course, that meant my collection of 45s was, uh, for the first few months anyway, very popular. So much so that a few of them disappeared. And freed from the regulation school uniform, I turned up at my first term at Caribou Hill Junior Secondary School in my nattiest Nehru jacket, paisley shirt and tie, bell bottoms that I'd made myself, and Cuban heel beetle boots. I stuck out like a sore thumb, with all the Canadian kids dressed like surfers in madras shirts, Lee jeans, and Converse runners. <laughs> I'd been exiled to Squaresville. Remember that lyric in Hendrix's Third Stone from the Sun song? And you'll never hear surf music again. <laughs> Vindication. <laughs> Soon enough, though, uh, Carnaby Street made its mark in Canada, and I found myself a tribe of fellow teen hippies, or was it mods? And England's blues bands found their way to local arenas. And the first big-name band I saw in concert was Cream in Vancouver in 1967. This was at the height of their meteoric rise to fame. And my buddies and I exited the Coliseum on the Pacific National Exhibition Grounds, aping the melody from Spoonful. Doo-dum, doo-dum, doo-dum. <laughs> so over the next year or two, I saw Blind Faith, Eric Clapton's first encore after Cream, the original Fleetwood Mac, headed by lead guitarist Peter Green, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Canned Heat, Country Joe and the Fish, The Mothers of Invention, Led Zeppelin, Big Brother and the Holding Company with Janis Joplin, Donovan, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, and Vanilla Fudge, Air Apparent, and Soft Machine, all on the same bill with headliner Jimi Hendrix for $3.50. That was the going rate for a multi-band concert in those days. At 17, having taken up the blues harp, harmonica, I was playing gigs around Vancouver and the lower mainland of BC. I'd been inspired first by those British blues bands and then the real thing that inspired them, harp players like Sonny Boy Williamson, Howlin' Wolf, Little Walter, James Cotton, Slim Harpo. Then there were the new kids on the block, Charlie Musselwhite, Magic Dick, Alan Wilson of Canned Heat, 
Paul Butterfield and Corky Siegel of the Siegel Schwal Band. Man, if any harp player grabbed my attention, it was Corky. I spent my 16th summer, 1968, playing their second breakthrough album, Say Siegel Schwal, over and over, trying to master Corky's 12-bar laments. And that stuff still sounds fresh today, just classic blues. The other founding member, Jim Schwal, plays a mean guitar, quite unlike the heavy electric style of Clapton and Hendrix that topped the charts at the time. And I discovered, researching this script, he's an accomplished photographer. The so-called West Coast circuit rotated some amazing music and entertainment through Vancouver. And I got to jam with some of the best. There's just one surviving snapshot of me in my photo albums, playing with a band from California sometime around 1972. Well, I really began my apprenticeship as a concert photographer with the Nikon FM I bought in 1981. Not commercially, I, I always had the camera with me and so I spent a lot of time in nightclubs just photographing friends. I just saw the results as documents of the music scene in Vancouver at the time. And a lot of great bands came out of that scene and studios like Network Records flourished. Bands like uh, Bob's Your Uncle, Moev, Skinny Puppy, and the Grapes of Wrath. There was the Beverly Sisters, No Means No, DOA, playing a range of music from punk to industrial to new wave of the time. It really was one of the most exciting times for music in BC. My film of choice was Ilford HP5, often rated at just ASA 320, developed in stock microfin. And you can be sure, again, I had that Series E 50mm f1.8 wide open. In the 90s, I was photographing and writing reviews for local newspapers, so I ended up shooting a lot of gigs from front stage, just like uh, the first Mahavishnu concert. It wasn't that lucrative, but it did get me into a lot of concerts, so I didn't leave right after the usual three-song rule, a convention which, incidentally, came out of the 80s, when stages were invaded by amateurs who didn't know how to shoot without flash. And rumor has it that it was Bruce Springsteen who got tired of being blinded, and the compromise three-song rule came about. By that time, I'd succumbed to autofocus, mostly using a Nikon F90X, usually with a 300mm F4AF. Man, what a beast that lens was. And why did I sell it? Well, to buy into the Fuji mirrorless system, but more on that later. I shot mostly black and white, so I could develop and print right after the show and write my review while prints dried. At that time, I also began scanning prints, then negs, and submitting digital files. That also coincided with the release of Ilford's Delta 3200 black and white film, which I adopted enthusiastically. Of all the concert photos I made during that time, I treasure the shot of Long John Baldry, arguably one of the first blues singers in the UK. Members of his early bands included Mick Jagger, Jack Bruce, Charlie Watts, and Reg Dwight, who combined fellow band member Elton Dean's first name and Baldry's to launch his solo career as Elton John. My best photo of Long John was a gift from him. He played right to the camera. Undoubtedly the best showman I ever had the pleasure of photographing. Sadly, just four years before his untimely death in 2005. I preferred Delta 3200 to fast color films available at the time, which I often used for fashion catwalk shows because, well, fashion. <laughs> For concerts, I just preferred the look of black and white, and I still often convert digital files. When shooting with the Fuji camera, I like the Acros film simulation. It produces a nice image. Of course, the days of ISO restrictions are pretty much behind us. Shooting now with the Nikon Z6 in particular, I can get acceptable results all the way up to 6400 and beyond. I mean, <laughs> compare the latest digital results with that Delta 3200. And I wasn't agonizing over the grain in those shots. It's part of the um, gritty look of the stage. The Fuji X-Pro2 isn't bad, but as many people have said, skin starts looking weird over ISO 3200. I don't know if that's been fixed in more recent cameras. At the dawn of the 21st century, it dawned <laughs> on me that digital photography was the future 
kind of like mirrorless is today. At least that's where manufacturers were taking things. And digital certainly made sense for photojournalism. So I invested in a camera that I could use with my collection of Nikkor glass, a Fujifilm Fine Pix S2 Pro, based on the Nikon N80 or F80 body in Canada. At the time, 2002, DP Review referred to its 12 million pixels as astounding. <laughs> anyway, I stuck with that camera and its hit and miss focusing to produce thousands of photos of everything from bicycle components to bike races and, um, and musicians. Since then, I've owned Nikon APS-C cameras like the D7000 until I graduated to full frame with the D800 or no, the D600 first and then the D800. Of course, like most people these days, the camera I always have with me is attached to a phone. And I made a few concert photos with those, which are at least good enough, not as good as, I don't know, the old Zenit, <laughs> to preserve a memory. Now I use the full frame Z system for most things. And the Z6 is incredible in low light. And I can't wait to see what the impending Z9 can do, uh, if the performing arts can weather <laughs> the present global disruptions. There's always the street, for musicians as well as photographers. Along the way, I've used various formats to document the busker's life. I did get to shoot a bit of theater before COVID struck, and I was very happy with the Z system with the adapted F mount lenses. And last summer, things started opening up a bit here. I think governments decided that the, the natives were getting restless. Uh, vaccination levels were rising and the economy was tanking. And speaking of the economy, COVID has been a disaster for concert promoters, venues, and the artists themselves. Not to mention photographers who specialize in the genre. I did manage to get out to one gig last summer with the latest Z mount lenses. Admittedly, I found it stressful. Not using uh, the Z gear, but because people were still wanting to like shake hands, a few drinks and Everyone forgets the protocols, right? Now we've got yet another variant to worry about. And not because of Delta or Omicron mutations. <laughs> Just a minute. I think there's a band name to be had there. But I don't think I'd chase this specialty today. Not that I ever did, but from what I can see, it's a crazy market. While I've been putting this together, I shared a couple of photos with pictured artists, and they were grateful for the memories. Because like those shots had their day, like a lot of the bands in them. <laughs> and there's no way I'd sign rights grabbing contracts like some performers have been pushing on photographers recently. I'm not David Bailey, but he often refuses to shoot celebrities today. Yeah, the guy whose photos literally defined the 60s with those amazing portraits of the Beatles, the Stones, Michael Caine and dozens of other stars. His fashion work for Vogue with models like Penelope Tree and Twiggy. For instance, he turned down a request to photograph Lady Gaga. An interviewer asked why he wasn't interested in today's stars, and Bailey insinuated that they're often shallow and obstinate, and they want the copyright to his photos. They're dreaming, Bailey said. I'm not going to give my copyright to a whatever they are, celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love Bailey. Performers are cutting off their own noses with these misdirected rights grabs, and photographers who agree to such arrangements, well, what's the point? The idea that a subservient relationship will elevate their fame? Because as the famous uh, John Lennon David Bowie lyric says, fame puts you there where things are hollow. <laughs> what's your name? I don't know about other jurisdictions, but in Canada, after a long overdue amendment to copyright law in 2012, BC 11, the Copyright Modernization Act to be precise, the photographer owns copyright upon creation of the image, commissioned or not. Still, as always, contracts are important. Thanks for joining me on this little journey through a subsection of my life in photography. I hope you got something out of it, if only some musicians to check out. 
And if you did enjoy it, please do give this video the old thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel, and this is the kind of thing you'd like to see more of, please uh, join my uh, fan club. Hit that notification bell to be alerted to future content. In the meantime, take care of yourselves. Cheers. We'll see you later.